Boulevard, over 21 women have disappeared from this street and turned up later, murdered and dumped on the outskirts of the city. The killer or killers is still at large. Live from Times Square, New York City, Detective Joe Surlack. Our suspect has killed several women here in the New York area and moved on. We tracked them across the country by counting dead bodies. He loves them, then leaves them dead. From Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Detective Mike Smith of the Metropolitan Police Department. In Nashville, we're part of a multi-state investigation in the red-headed murder cases. At least eight women have been dumped off of main roads and interstate highways in Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. From Utah, Detective Jim Bell. Here in Salt Lake City in the northern Utah area, we've got 14 murdered or missing women. From Washington State, Sheriff James Montgomery. There may be 300 serial killers across the country. Here in Seattle, King County, we've got the biggest case in America. He's killed at least 48 teenage girls that we know of. And most were taken from the SeaTac Strip, Pacific Highway South, not too far from the airport. It's a highly transient area, south of Seattle, near the Green River. That's where they found the first body. The killer has eluded police for six years, but he's still out there, somewhere in America, stalking a highway in search of his next victim. Now it's time for you to stop him and help bring him to justice. On Manhunt, live. Live from Seattle, Mr. Patrick Duffy. Good evening. Seattle, it's a great city to live in. And I know because I grew up here. And I've come back tonight on a very special mission. An international manhunt for the so-called Green River Killer. Not just America's most wanted, but perhaps the most dangerous single killer in the entire world. And maybe the most baffling. We don't know his name, we don't have a picture, there are very few clues. He is one of a new breed of murderer, a serial killer, a stranger who kills strangers. His victims, almost always women, chosen by chance, murdered without motive, their bodies discarded, some never to be found. We're dedicating this program to their memories, and you'll see a serial, serial murder doesn't just happen to street kids in Seattle. Nobody is safe, not the girl next door, not the girl upstairs. Tonight, working with the police departments across the country and local Crime Stoppers organizations, we're going to call attention to the national epidemic of serial killing. And now, America's top law enforcement official, the Attorney General of the United States. Responsible citizen involvement in the fight against crime is key to protecting our communities and ensuring the safety of our families. And it's that type of involvement that I'm asking you to take part in tonight. If you know of something that might be of help to the officials investigating the Green River murders, or if you have any information on any serious crimes anywhere in the country, please call. Your participation is vital, and your call could literally mean the difference between life and death. Working together, we can make a real difference in fighting crime and in putting criminals behind bars. And tonight, you can help make that difference. Thank you, and God bless you. And now here's correspondent Adrian Meltzer. Thank you, Patrick. There are three basic elements to our strike force. First, the professionals. Through the courtesy of American Airlines, we've flown in seasoned detectives from every corner of the country. Many of them have unsolved serial murders in their own cities and towns. They constitute perhaps the most powerful crime writing unit ever assembled for a television broadcast. Second, we have the technology, computers coast-to-coast -coast satellite links, and banks of 1-800 telephone lines open right now for calls. Calls from the single most important part of our team, you, the viewer. 
because tonight we're going to ask you to give us the leads that will help catch the killer. Detective Merrill Carner is regional coordinator of the Seattle King County chapter of Crime Stoppers, a unique community crime fighting tool that has helped solve more than 200,000 felonies worldwide. Merrill? Patrick, uh, this is an exciting evening and Manhunt Live is prepared tonight to offer a reward of up to $100,000 for information leading to the arrest and charge or indictment of the suspect involved in the Green River killings. This is an exciting portion for us to be involved with. These phone lines tonight will be open for two to three weeks and we're expecting a lot of phone calls. It's uh, when the caller calls, the investigator will explain how the reward system works, how the coding system works, and so forth. And uh, we want the viewers to give us a call tonight. Great. Also with us is Greg McAleese, founder of Crime Stoppers. Greg, what do you hope to accomplish with tonight's program? Well, Patrick, we've got millions of viewers. Thousands of them have information about serious offenses. We want to try to obviously solve the Green River killing, but not only that, we'd really like to be able to get information about the next generation of serial killers. Anybody who has committed one, maybe two murders or attempted murders, anybody who has outstanding warrants, anybody who's a serial rapist, all of this information can be very helpful to us. And we hope that they will use this program as their weapon. Wonderful. Thank you both for being here. Adrian? Remember, these numbers are good for the U.S. and Canada only. If our detectives do receive a hot tip, King County Prosecutor Al Matthews and police are here to respond and will give you a live update if any suspect is apprehended. The full conditions and terms of the reward will be posted at the conclusion of the program. Now remember, this is not just a television program. It's a real manhunt, and you can be a part of it. One call, your call, can make a difference. The weapon is in your hand. And now, in these next two hours, you'll be given a unique opportunity to go behind the scenes of one of the most bizarre murder cases in history. You'll become detectives yourselves. One leg fully extended. The left, leg, the left knee is caught at a real abrupt angle. View actual police footage. Yes, sir. And hunt for clues at the killer's dumping ground. Hear hunches from the experts. To me, he's more of a quasi man. There are fantasies going on in his head. I don't know if this guy's a pervert, but if he's dealing with a hooker. They arrested her for prostitution and didn't know who she was. She thought Get a first hand game. look at evidence from the files and laboratories of the Green River Task Force. Patrol the strip with undercover detectives. I fall into too many turns. You're going to take over. Interrogate potential witnesses. I almost got it. Headshot. Fast. They're down. That's it. And tonight, uncover fresh clues about the killer, his victims, and mistakes even he doesn't know he made. You see, here's our message to the Green River Killer. You think you've committed the perfect crime, but you're wrong. Because we're going to expose mistakes that you've made. We're going to catch you, starting tonight on Manhunt. Sponsored in part by New Bounce, the only fabric softener with stain guard. I'm Patrick Duffy. Live from Seattle, our manhunt has begun. Already viewers from around the country are phoning in tips. Okay, if you have any information regarding the Green River serial killer, the number to call is 1-800-722-5555. Now your phone call will be received anonymously. The person on the other end of the line will assign you a code, explain how the code works, and how to claim your reward. Tonight we want to dispel any romantic notion anyone has about serial killers. They are vicious, cowardly takers of human lives, larger than life hardly. They come on as mild-mannered, just your average, quiet, next-door neighbor type. And that's what makes them so elusive and so deadly. A city in terror. Nine young women have been tortured, killed, and dumped near the freeway. A suspect who claims split personalities is captured and convicted. I can't find the words to express the sorrow I feel for what I've done. Kenneth Bianchi, security guard. In no way can I take away the pain they have given to others. The Hillside Strangler, 
Jekyll and Hyde. Six people shot dead, seven more wounded, by David Berkowitz. His double life, postal clerk, the son of Sam. He entertained children in the hospital and his home. 33 young boys were found buried in his basement and backyard. John Gacy, the killer clown. Thirteen women opened their doors to this killer, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler. His mother worked at the university registrar's office. We did love each other, but it was a horrible, twisted, drunken, pain, love-hate thing. And we fed off each other for that three years. And pretty soon, it wasn't good enough. I either had to kill her or I had to kill somebody else. His M.O. cruised the campus looking for hitchhikers. I killed a co-ed in January of 1973. And I said, this has to stop. Less than 30 days later, this is January 8th. Jan uh, February 5th, I killed two co-eds. He shot or stabbed six young women. And then he stopped. It was horrible. For them and for me, too. I was carrying it on and on. I'll live with it till I die, till I'm dead. I never did it again. But you say, wait a minute, you cut your mother's throat. Yeah, but I hit her in the head with a hammer. She was senseless. And sadly, some people have analogized that to a slaughter of a cow. Edmund Emil Kemper, serving life in a California prison. Perhaps the most notorious of them all, Ted Bundy. Dashing, articulate, connected. He acted as his own lawyer at the trial. Described by many as possessing a fatal charm, authorities think he murdered over 40 women, yet he's never confessed to any, not one. I've been kept in isolation for six months. I've been kept away from the press. I've been buried by you. You've been talking for six months. I think it's my turn now. Bundy is set to be executed in Florida within 60 days. Time has run out for the lady killer. But of all the serial homicides, none can match the toll of the Green River Killer. He is history's most prolific serial murderer. His story is cloaked in mystery, a puzzling riddle of two rivers. One starts in the Cascade Mountain Range, 50 miles from Seattle. The Green River's headwaters. Pure, nurturing. Tumbling down the Kent Valley to the Pacific Ocean. One river peaceful, a ribbon of life, the other polluted, a ribbon of asphalt and neon. Pacific Highway South, the SeaTac Strip. A two mile stretch of hookers and honky tonk right next to Seattle's airport. Drugs, pornography, teenage sex for sale. It starts as a scene played out a hundred times a night on the strip. It ends here. The Green River, no longer a river of life. One week later, the body of Wendy Caulfield was discovered by two boys bicycling over the Peck Bridge. Police recovered the remains. The first Green River victim found. Only two days after Wendy's body is removed from the water, the Green River killer strikes again. Within a month, five more bodies dumped in the Green River. To elude police, the killer gradually expands his dump sites to a 50-mile radius of the Strip. Like at Star Lake Road, 
a remote wooded grove where six skeletons are found. For a year and a half, a young woman disappears or a body is discovered at the rate of almost one per week. Then, for inexplicable reasons, the killing in Seattle ends. The Green River Killer goes on the move. 22 women dead, four officially attributed to the killer. New killing fields. More than 38 bodies have been recovered. The most recent, just last week. The victims, street people. Most killed like those in Seattle. Some believe it might be the work of the Green River Killer. In 1984, a special police task force was established. Captain Bob Evans, Lieutenant Dan Nolan have directed the investigation for much of these last four years. Captain, I have to ask you first, uh, the most obvious question is, is why don't we know more about the killer? Patrick, the serial murder investigation is, is a very difficult and complex thing. It's much different than a traditional criminal homicide investigation where you have a, a fresh crime scene, uh, witnesses present, uh, fresh evidence, the smoking gun, if you will. Our cases, for the large part, uh, we've found our victim anywhere from six months to six years after the killer's been there. And it's just a, a tremendously difficult case to go in and build from that perspective. So what type of information can our audience call in that can help the investigation? Patrick, serial killing is not just a police problem. It's a problem that affects everyone in our country. And tonight, with the help of our viewers, we're going to solve some serial crimes. Serial killers typically keep souvenirs of their victims. They keep necklaces, they keep earrings, they keep jewelry, perhaps to give to someone they care about. They keep photographs of their victims, they keep news articles, perhaps to use as arousal in their next sexual attack. If anyone out there knows of anyone that is doing those kinds of things, we need your help tonight. So please call in. Thank you both for being here tonight. Adrian, back to you. Okay, so far we have received 750 calls, 150 in the first few minutes of this show. About half have been from Seattle, the rest from all over the country on other cases. We have one regarding a serial rapist in Massachusetts. We have a good tip on a serial killing in Delaware. And a caller from Everett, Washington has given information about a man now living in San Diego who lived in Kent where the first five bodies were found. This is an incredible response. Please keep calling. Did you give your name when you talked to him? Coming up, a look at what experts say about the killer's identity. A behind-the-scenes view from inside the Green River Task Force. Next on Manhunt. I don't know if this guy's a pervert, but if it's dealing with a hooker, you know, you can almost ask anything if the price is right. I've talked to enough of them, and they'll tie you up if you want. Welcome back to Manhunt, on the track of America's most vicious criminals, serial killers. If you have any information regarding the Green River serial killer or any other unsolved homicides around the country, the number to call is 1-800-722-5555. Who is the Green River killer? Everyone has their hunch, but so do the experts, the Green River Task Force. Tonight, we're taking you behind locked doors of the investigation's war room. Good morning. This is the largest single manhunt ever mounted to catch a killer. The cost? More than $15 million since the murders began. The manpower? Over 125 law enforcement officials from a dozen different agencies. From 1981 and 1982, but they've all been destroyed. There are 30,000 pages of tips and leads each the result of a grueling investigative process. Much of it pioneering police work, especially in the deployment of computers and forensic science. 9,000 items of evidence. Six years of legal exhibits waiting to be presented in a court of law. Beside each desk, the motivation. 
48 unsolved murders. Victimology indicates that most of our and now the investigators in closed door session with their own professional theories about who the Green River killer may be. My hunch is the guy is a white male, about 40, uh, single, probably uh, uh, ex-military person, right around 40, late 30s, early 40s. I think he's probably in the construction trades. He can get up and uh, move to another area and get a job easily. He has a way about him that gets these girls to come with him. And He's that's a... something that we all think about, I'm sure. He's the perfect John. And that's two categories. A professional clean-cut guy or a mild, overweight, pudgy kind of person that appears to be harmless. I mean, you've got two extremes there. A guy that maybe will pay you very well, or a guy you know ain't a cop, and he's just going to give you the money for whatever, and be grateful that you serviced him, and then go on about his business. So you got two kinds. What about his sexual preferences? So do you think he's a pervert, or do you think he's he just gets straight sex? Do you think he's uh, maybe homosexual? I don't know this guy's a pervert, but if he's dealing with a hooker, you know, you can almost ask anything if the price is right. I've talked to enough of them, and they'll tie you up if you want. There's a psychological perversion there that probably could manifest itself in, in homosexuality as well as heterosexual. And I don't think the man is married. Why do you think he's picked prostitutes? I think he not only picked the hookers because he may have a woman problem, but also because society ain't going to say a hell of a lot for girls that are on the street. Serves them right. Shouldn't be out there in the first place. To me, is more like an animal that stalks a victim kills a victim and disposes of the remains and, and an animal is going to seek the easiest easiest prey it can seek to kill for whatever its purpose is some of us have been here for six years looking for this particular a demon of sorts uh, a lot of us have been here four years some are just here in the last year or two and we are going to stay at this till we catch this guy. And I think that that's one of the things that keeps us going. Our ego, in one case, we, we want to catch the guy, but there are other victims out there that he's going to take uh, if we don't get him. Well, I think they're all our daughters in a way. Um, we've come to know them better than their families did because of the investigations that we've done on them. And I mean, they were just 15, 16 years old. I've got kids that were their age when we were heavily involved in this case. He's got to make an atonement. I don't want to say revenge, so I'll just say justice, but the boy owes us, and uh, we're going to try to collect on it. We are getting an unbelievable response so far. We received a call about a serial murder in New Bedford, Massachusetts that happened just last week. A number of calls about the disappearance of young girls in Illinois, a call about sexual assaults in Virginia, a serial murder case in Alabama. It's really incredible. We're really touching a nerve all over the country. When we return, we'll go to the streets of New York, and Patrick Duffy will talk to the prey of the serial killer, Runaways. They arrested her for prostitution and didn't know who she was. She, she thought it was a game. As most of you know, Premier Gorbachev is in New York right now. He's causing quite a stir with his presence there. He's also causing a few problems with our ability to transmit, but we're going to try right now to take you to Times Square, New York City. It's been called the crossroads of the world, but it's also a glittering magnet for young runaways and the stocking ground for those who would take advantage of them. Pimps, pushers, and other dealers yes, of death, including killers. Times Square is also the beat of Father Bruce Ritter, founder and head of Covenant House, an international shelter for runaways headquartered in New York. Father Ritter, just how bad is the runaway problem in New York and the entire country? It is very bad. Uh, there are at least, very conservatively speaking, between 30 and 40,000 runaways on the streets here in New York right now. Around the country, at least a million kids a year run away, but more importantly, there are about a half a million American kids that are street kids. They're not runaways. 
They live almost entirely on the streets and they don't survive very long. Well, what can we do about the problem ourselves? Basically, these kids need a place to come to live. You know, uh, this year, this, this month, more than 1,000 kids will come into Covenant House. This year, 25,000 street kids will come. And unless they receive help, most of them don't survive very long. Three months is a long time on the street. Six months is forever. And after a year, forget about it. They're not going to make it back. And now we're going to speak to one of those runaways. Her name is Christy. She's 18 years old, and she's been on the street for one year. Christy, how do people survive on the street? Can you hear me, Christy? How do people survive on the street? I don't think Christy can hear us right now, but I think Father Ritter will translate, transfer that to her. Father, will you relay these to her? It's another one of those problems in transmitting from here to there at this particular time. I was very lucky. Got I got here early, and shortly after I got here, I got into Covenant House, I got a job. I'm doing good for myself, but people basically what they do is they sleep on the subways, sleep in corners. When they wake up in the morning, the first thought is, how am I going to make it through the day? Christy, why did you run away? Father, can you okay, ask her that? Why did you run away in the first place? I, I, I left to start over again. I see. Do you think you'll ever go back to the street now that you've been through that experience? No, never. It's terrible. There's just no, once you get in, all you want is out. Okay. Thank you, Father, and good luck, Christy. Adrian? According to the National Network of Runaway and Youth Services, there are over a million runaways wandering the streets, like Debbie Estes, who ran away at 15 in 1982, at the height of the Green River killings. We buried Debbie in a pink child's casket uh, because she, she liked pink and she was a child. She left home for a fun. After six years, task force investigators had grown close to the family. Dave's own daughter is about Debbie's age. She was a um, little tomboy. You know, she uh, um, liked to play with boys, um, climb trees. You know, she wasn't afraid of anything. You see there, she's got lipstick on. and I think she was in the sixth grade. She was just getting more out of the, the tomboy stage into the feminine. When I started finding out what was going on, uh, it was too late because it had been going on for a while. Debbie was going to Planned Parenthood and getting birth control pills when she was 11, 12 years old. I found out that she was smoking marijuana. Uh, I found out that uh, boys were a lot more interested in her than just being friends. Uh, a lot of things that break some mother's heart. Debbie's mugshot. They arrested her for prostitution and didn't know who she was. She, she thought it was a game. I mean, that was fun for, for people not to know who she really is. She thought she was getting away with something. You think you're raising your kids normal, you know, you're doing everything right. And uh, how she could get involved in something like that, you know, when she'd never been exposed to it, um, I couldn't understand it. I just, I couldn't understand it at all. Debbie ran away several times. Then they lost contact with her. Tom and Carol started to search. They began in downtown Seattle, passing out pictures of their daughter. Tom traveled as far as California and Nevada. It would be hard for any father. After all, it's my daughter that I'm looking for. A kid that I cared about, cared that I, a kid that I loved. My last born, my baby. We looked for Debbie for six years. Um, 
aunt when they found her. Um, I just thank God they found her. I, I sat down at the funeral home for three hours. Telling her all the things that I tried to tell her when she was alive. If you have kids and they're out in the street, you better go get them. Because if you don't, you won't have them. And when they're dead, they're dead. Forever is forever. The story of Debbie Estes came to a close when her body was found last May. But for four young girls, the final chapter has yet to be written. These are the unidentifieds. The remains have been found, but no one has been able to determine who they are. When we return, we'll see a forensic sculptor try and give a face to one of these victims for the first time. And go behind police lines to a dump site of the Green River Killer. Imagine that you're a member of the task force. You're investigating what could be the perfect murder. No crime site, no motivation, and no clues. And until she is discovered, which could be years after the killing, you don't even know there's a victim. Moreover, it's been acted upon by the dank climate of the Pacific Northwest, so conducive to the rapid decomposition of any organic matter. If and when the body is found, it's in a place that's been lost and forgotten. In the sterile language of cops, this is a dump site. You are about to go behind police lines. You are Detective Dave Reichardt. You've been with the investigation since the very first victim. Located the mandible. There are also some teeth missing from that. Forty times before, you've followed the same path as the killer. Immediately visible at this time. This is the closest you've ever come to meeting him. The remains are kind of scattered. Somewhere there may be a clue, slender as a sliver of the killer's fingernail buried in over an acre of brush. That looks like a band-aid or a piece of, uh, piece of dog. That's why you clear the site with scissors. Shovel with tweezers. A robin's nest, dismantled strand by strand, in case a bird has woven in a thread of the killer's coat. The work resembles, but is even more precise than an archaeological dig. I don't know, race is going to be a problem until we get back in the On the human body, there are few parts that don't decompose in the first year. The hair mass, nails, and the bones. But rarely do they disclose identity. The surest ID tags are the teeth, which hold the secrets of age, and, through dental records, the exact identity of the victim. I think that the, the other features of the skeleton certainly put it in, the, in that mid-second uh, decade of life. Yet even that may not be enough. In Seattle, there are three boxes which enclose remains that cannot be buried. They are the unidentified. But they are not forgotten. Tonight, with your help, we'll try and find their names. Identifying the remains of victims is one of the most difficult jobs in forensic science. And when science reaches its limits, sometimes art can help. 
With us now is King County Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Donald Ray and sculptor Betty Pat Gatlin. Her expertise, facial reconstruction. Tonight, Dr. Ray has brought over a reconstructed skull of one of the four unidentified Green River victims. Dr. Ray, what have you been able to tell so far from the remains that you have? Certainly the remains were discovered in March of 84. Uh, there wasn't any hair or clothing with the remains. We were able, however, to determine uh, sex. She's that uh, of a female, uh, white, and roughly uh, 14 to 16 years of age. So, Betty Pat, this is where your job takes over. Now, how do you help Dr. Ray? I start with a clean skull, knowing the age, sex, and race of the individual. I select a table of soft tissue measurements and I cut rubber erasing material and apply it directly to the skull. This tells me how much clay to put over these particular bones. This will give me the shape of the face. Then all of the features, the location of the features alone will give some resemblance, but the, the measurements that I can make on the nose and the mouth and so on will pretty much indicate the appearance of this person in life. And these measurements are all very accurate and uh, the same for victims? It's, a, it's an accurate average. An accurate well, average. Well, thank you. <laughs> Our hope tonight is that through the teamwork of Dr. Ray and Betty Pat, that someone watching will call in with this young woman's name. Identifying this woman may be the one bit of information that will lead us directly to the killer. We'll return later to check their progress. The Green River killings have affected the lives of many people. In fact, most of the victims no one ever even thinks of. These are the families of missing young girls all up and down the West Coast like Tracy Winston. Tracy was always very energetic, a very affectionate little girl. And she always saw what she thought was the, the good side of somebody. She didn't think that anybody would, anybody would try to harm her. Tracy was always willing to give a hug and she would walk by me and just maybe put her arms around me and say, I love you, mom. If she's alive, we want her to contact us. We want her to know that we love her. With us tonight is Tracy's mother and her brother Kevin. Murdy, when did you last see Tracy? The last time we saw Tracy was on Mother's Day, 1983. Five years ago. Do you have any clues whatsoever as to her whereabouts, where she might have gone? No, we don't. In the beginning, there were some leads, some tips that came in, but they didn't materialize into anything solid. Kevin, it's been five years for you. You must have something you want to say to your sister. She's watching tonight. What would it be? I'd just like to say that I love you very much, and I want you to come home. Yeah. Marty? If Tracy is watching, I, I do have something I would like to say to Please. her. Tracy Ann, I couldn't possibly put five years into this brief moment. But a lot of things have changed. Jan and Trish are both married and they have small children. Danette graduated from Evergreen and has a pilot's license now. Dad teaches a cooking class and Chip and Kevin have grown so much. Even though these things have changed, the one thing that's remained constant, Tracy, is that we love you and we want you to come home or we want to hear from you more than anything in the world. Thank you both for being here. Tracy, if you're watching, please call. If anyone knows anything about this girl, anything at all, please call us right now. Tracy Ann Winston. She disappeared from the Northgate Mall area in Seattle on September 12, 1983. If you know something about her or about the person who may be responsible for her disappearance, that's why we're here. We ask you to call now. As we mentioned, this program is dedicated to the victims of the Green River Killer. You've heard about two of them. Throughout the program, you'll get to know more, all from family photos and the words of their own mothers. We have had incredible calls so far. We have a call from someone in New York who heard a man bragging about hunting down women. Information from New York, a caller says two men were murdered last month. The killer used a 45 caliber handgun and is hiding out at a Manhattan motel. We are passing this on to the New York PD homicide detectives now. A caller from Wonder Lake, Illinois, has reported a possible double kidnapping and has identified a suspect. Our investigators will pass the information to Illinois police tonight. And a caller from Monroe, Washington, says the Green River Killer confessed to him. He's passed a name to our investigators. I think we have a hot tip right now, actually, from Lieutenant Tim Burns from the New York PD. Tim, what do we have here? 
We have a caller. It's a call that said that possibly his sister might have been taken by the Green River Killer from a hotel in one part of Washington and taken here to the SeaTac area. Uh, the person displayed a, uh, a kind of a schizophrenic personality, went from a Jekyll and Hyde, beat the sister up, and left her in the uh, motel room all beat up. Uh, he's given us some additional information, and the Green River Task Force is taking it over now, so we'll continue that investigation. Okay, thank you very much now. Seattle. All right, Seattle. from Seattle, okay. Remember, I implore you, if you have any information regarding any unsolved homicides around the country, the number is 1-800-722-5555. Now, we've hinted about mistakes the Green River Killer has made, some even he doesn't know about. These mistakes constitute some of the best evidence police have, and you'll see some of them when we return on Debbie, she, she was a very sweet girl. She was well liked by everybody. One thing that she really liked to do was write poems. I miss my daughter, Deborah, and I love her more than anyone in the world. I mean, my God, she was only 23 years old. On the face of it, it seems the Green River Killer has fashioned the perfect crime. How else can he have gotten away with murder so many times? But the man whom some have credited with a high IQ has made some very telling operational mistakes. What you are about to watch is footage from the vaults of the Green River Task Force. A police dog, tracking the remains of a victim found across the road, picks up a new scent and another body. But this one is different from all the others. It's the first one that's been buried. But why? To find out, police sift every grain of soil. But it's the remains themselves that give the real answer. The killer made a mistake. He murdered someone he didn't count on. A mother eight months pregnant. With me now is Dave Reichert, lead detective of the Green River Task Force. Dave, the clip was just over about the girl eight months pregnant. What other mistakes or information do you have about the killer? Well, one of the most important facts that we know is that our killer was driving a pickup truck in 1983. And we have five cases where uh, we have witnesses who have identified one of our victims being in or near a pickup truck. In three of those cases, the pickup truck was described as a Ford pickup truck late 60s, early 70s model. Uh, the other two were they were a GMC product. Now some of these uh, witnesses also, also described the uh, bumper of the truck as being white in color. That's the rear bumper. Uh, the canopy was a light color and was about cab high uh, or just a little bit higher, maybe two or three inches higher. Uh, the passenger side of the truck had primer spots on it like uh, the, the killer had done some body work to it. So that's important then that the, the killer may have repainted his truck a number of times. Yes, that's true. Well, that's a very important fact for any of you out there who might remember a neighbor who maybe always seemed to be changing the color of his pickup truck. Or if anyone saw a truck or a vehicle like this around the SeaTac Strip between 1982 and 1984, or just knows somebody who owns such a truck, it could be important information. Please call. You may be able to give us the one piece of information that we need. Incidentally, we've had an amazing response on the phone bank so far. Adrian, back to you to how many phone calls and what they're about. Okay, we have the name of a person who lived in Seattle and has moved to San Diego. The caller suspects him. Also, the name of a suspect who brutally raped two girls in Seattle. New York, a suspect who killed a girl two years ago and dumped the body in a river. And Seattle, a Vietnam vet now living in Seattle. The caller was a family member. Please, I implore you, if you have other information like this, please call us, 1-800-722-5555. You've seen some of the mistakes that the killer has made. Any of them could eventually lead the task force to him, but there's, there's one mistake that we haven't told you about so far. In fact, except for a handful of police and press, no one knows about this, even the killer. It's been kept a secret since 1985, and now, for the first time on national television, that secret is going to be revealed. 
There is a survivor of what some believe to be a Green River killing, and you're going to meet her next. This is a Q13 Manhunt Update. I'm Catherine Carboni, reporting live from the Manhunt Phone Center, where detectives are taking calls from all over the country from people who have tips or information on the Green River Killer. With me tonight is Detective Dave Reichert of the Green River Task Force. Shortly after the end of the 5 o'clock broadcast, there was quite a bit of excitement in the phone room when a man called in who we thought might have been, we think may be, the Green River Killer. What did this man tell you? What information did he give you? He didn't give me any information at all, really. Um, when I got on the phone, the first thing he said to me was, uh, I'm the guy you're looking for. And, uh, of course, at first I was really excited about that and uh, hopeful. But as the conversation went on, uh, I began to feel just a little bit uneasy about the call. I really didn't believe that, uh, that he was the person that he said he was. What clues did he give you at first that made you think that he could be the man? Well, like I say, he didn't really give me any clues. It's just the fact that he stated that he was the, the Green River Killer or that he was the, the man that I was looking for. And uh, he was very uh, soft-spoken. He chose his words carefully. He uh, spoke in generalities. And uh, at thir first, I thought he was maybe playing a game with me and that he really was the guy. But as we progressed, uh, and I asked him for specifics about uh, certain victims. Uh, he didn't want to supply me with that. And I discussed it with John Douglas, who was from the FBI Behavioral Science Center, and we both kind of felt that if this was really a killer, uh, he would go ahead and volunteer a little bit of information anyway, just so that I could verify that he was who he said he was. Are you ready to say definitely that this was not the man? No, no, uh-uh. No, I'm not able to say that either. So this just, could be him? You bet, yeah. It's just too hard to tell over the phone. He made some promises to me uh, about mailing some information to me, and we'll see what, what happens. Hopefully, we'll get some information that way. All right. Thank you very much, Detective Dave Reichert. You're welcome. The phones here at the Manhunt Center are very busy. If you are having trouble getting through, please keep trying. Again, the phones will be open for a couple of days, so please keep trying. Your information is very valuable. I'm Catherine Carboni, reporting live from the Manhunt Center, and we'll be back to our special presentation of Manhunt Live after these messages. Welcome back. We're live from Seattle, Washington. We're here tonight with the largest televised investigation in history to catch America's most vicious serial murderer, the Green River Killer. Over the past six years, he's murdered dozens of young women all up and down the West Coast. Detectives from throughout North America are here tonight to respond to your calls. If you have any information about the Green River Killer, please call us now. Okay, the number to call is 1-800-722-5555. Prosecuting attorney Al Matthews is standing by with police to take action if they think an arrest can be made. And now here's Patrick to show you a face that will be hard for you to forget. We call her Christina. That's not her real name or her real face. We've disguised her. Until tonight, she's been hiding and has never been interviewed by the media. Three years ago, she was brutally beaten, raped, and murdered, or so her killer thought. She's come back from the deathbed that he made for her to speak to him tonight. Many believe she's a victim of the Green River Killer. A police psychiatrist asked Christina how she feels about her attacker. I hate him. And what she would say if she could see him again? Nothing. And what she would want to do? Kill him. Christina will have even more to say to the man who tried to kill her during the next hour. We don't know who you are, but she does. And she'll describe how you looked, what you wore, and later in the show she'll have more to say about how she was able to outsmart you. And now to New York again, live, and the case of Richard Caputo. We know what he looks like. We know his name, and so someone might be in the audience who knows him also. He's this man, Richard Caputo. No one knows just how many he's murdered. Police have tracked him across the country by the trail of bodies he's left behind. They have warrants out for his arrest in Mexico City, San Francisco, and several counties in New York. Detective Joe Serlak, 
of the Yonkers Police Department is standing by live in New York. Detective Serlak, why is it so difficult to catch this man if we know so much about him? He is a master of disguise in that he speaks five different languages uh, fluently. He also has used 13 different names that we know of, and he can pass himself off as just about anybody. What is his MO? How does he operate? We call a computer initiates uh, relationships with well-to-do well females. After a period of time, he gets to move in with them, and when he tires of them, he kills them. So he might be living with a woman even right now? That's highly probable. His kind doesn't stop. So the message is, if any woman watching tonight recognizes this man, if anybody even faintly recognizes him, please do not confront him. He is extremely dangerous. Call this number, call your local Crime Stoppers, or the police as soon as you can. Adrian? Unlike New York, in the Green River case, we have no prime suspect. A lot of people believe there was a cover-up, or even worse, police collusion. Could a cop be the Green River killer? Since 1982, there's been another investigative team on the trail, not just of the killer, but the police themselves. We didn't have any really, uh, any, any real sense of whether or not the police were doing the appropriate thing, whether or not the politics had become involved in this, as it did in Atlanta and as it did in other jurisdictions when this problem happened. We simply didn't know what was really happening with this investigation. We have to be there. We have to tell the public. We have to do our job. But uh, we do things differently than the other media, and I, and I hope they respect it. So how many Gian and Smith are investigative reporters for the Seattle Times. We need a little bit more copy for the story, Bill. On their own time, they've created an amazing diary of who was where on the SeaTac strip for every day of the murders. Our responsibility to the public and to our readers was to find out just what this police task force that has spent the 12 or 15 million or however much it is at this point, whether or not they were doing their job in a way that the taxpayers had a right to expect that they were. One way to do it was to um, essentially find out what the vice unit had been doing, what kind of money they spent and so forth. So what we asked for was every expenditure, every dime that they spent for 82, 83, and 84 on the streets. And this is essentially one year, and there's just thousands of expenditures in here. So Their search did, produced no evidence of collusion or cover-up. We respect the Green River Task Force. We think they've done a lot of good things. Uh, they're, they're, they're experts and so forth. Mostly what we've hit on very hard are the things that were not done be before they were formed. Order of their disappearance like Tom this, Gian uh, has been on the case as long as the task force. And both he and his partner have developed their own hunches. I like the way you've broken down these things. They say the serial killers are very smart individuals. But to me, he's more of a quasi-man because he's, um, he's got the body of a man physically. He's got the years. He's old enough. But he's got uh, essentially the emotional mind of a three-year-old. He's stuck. There are fantasies going on in his head. Yeah. And that's all he does is think about those fantasies. This man is watching this program right now. He's watching every word we and everybody else in this program is saying about him. And he's wondering whether or not his neighbors and his friends, his family, are thinking about him too. And he's wondering whether or not he's going to be able to get away with this any longer. And my guess is he's not going to be able to get along with this, get away with this too much longer. Because somebody knows something about him, and they're going to tell somebody. We hope they do tell somebody. We hope they tell us. Please, if you know who the Green River Killer is, call. Even if he's someone you know well or even love, the killing has to end. Remember, the weapon is in your hand. Okay, in Nevada, we have the name of a suspect who is killing girls near Las Vegas. Vermont, sexual assault suspect who used an ice pick on victims. Vancouver, B.C., a caller stated his buddy has killed several women. He knew a lot of information. From North Carolina, the name of a suspect who killed his wife and kids and several in other cities. The caller seemed very sure. Now, even if you don't think you have any information now, jot this number down, 1-800-722-5555. Something may occur to you tomorrow, and these phones will be manned for the next two to three weeks by Crime Stoppers investigators. I also want to tell you our phone lines are backed up about a half an hour, so I implore you, please keep calling. Our lines are open for the next two to three weeks. Next on Manhunt, meet a real-life pimp and a prostitute.
get to know their names, get to know what they do, find out if they're caught. Because these suckers up here, they lie through their teeth. Oh no, I'm not a cop, baby. Mary was very free-spirited as a child, very lovable. I remember when she did good in school, she'd come home, she'd be so proud of her report card. She grew up too fast. She always told me, Mother, don't worry, I can handle it. She couldn't. Many young women come to the big city thinking they can handle the street life. Their tour guide to this demi-world is the pimp. We're going to meet one, a real one, not an actor, and a real prostitute. The pimp wants to recruit new girls into his stable, and his bait, drugs and sweet talk. Well, now, you see, you're in the right place, and I'm be seeing you out there trying, but you don't have the right direction, see? You don't know what you're doing, baby. You don't have the right instructions. Nobody's leading you the right way. There's a whole lot of things you can have. If you're playing with the right folks, if you're on the right team, if you're playing to win. I told you, baby, I'm a winner. I'm gonna make you a winner. All the typical one these days is, hey, baby, come be with a hero, not with a zero. You know, I said, baby, come with me. You know, I'll teach you. You know, I'll give you happiness. I'll give you love. Oh yeah, they're gonna get happiness and love. They're gonna get it with a needle. That's the only way they're gonna get it. What's your thing? You, you into drugs? You drink? What's your thing? Money? Oh baby, I'm gonna show you how to get the money. Okay? I'm gonna show you that. First of all. Okay? But the first thing we gotta understand is, it's us getting this money. It ain't just you. I'd come back and I'd have money and I'd end up giving it all to him for his drugs, his fly-by-nights, whatever he wanted to do. He, once he got my money, if I saw him that night, I was lucky. If I said anything, I got my face bashed in. You think there's something wrong with prostitution? You think there's something wrong with somebody giving you some money to spend time with you? Somebody liking you so much that they spend their money on you just to have a few minutes of your time? I got scars. I have broken hearts. I got a lot of promises. That's all you'll ever get. Because nobody means nothing to nobody out here. During the time the killer was in Seattle, a special police force was patrolling the SeaTac Strip day and night. They were called the Proactive Unit. Their mission was twofold, to warn the girls of the murder and to stake out his killing ground. You're undercover on the SeaTac Strip. That's a real prostitute over there looking for a car date. You've been tracking her for the past hour. But she's not your target. He is, the driver of that car. Okay, Matt, they're northbound on the highway. It's a little late. Uh, there's one following them now. But they are northbound near the gas station. Okay, I've got the eye. They're still going southbound on the highway. Okay, they're getting left turn lane at uh, 152nd. I'm going to follow them. They're playing tag team. Okay, we're making the left. Uh, in this residential area, if I follow them through too many turns, they're going to take over. The strategy keep the target vehicle always in sight without being made. Police talk for blowing cover. Okay, I'm pulling off there. Well, right now we're sitting on top of a white station wagon that just picked a girl up on the highway here. Uh, we don't know what he's going to do, so we're just going to watch him see what's happening because we don't know what the trigger is for this guy. So we're going to see how far he goes, what he does. If he makes any moves to hurt her or anything else, then we're going to move in on him. Hey, I think you're still 
still talking to deal or are they gonna make the date right there It'd be a little <laughs> too obvious to make it right here, but uh, you never know. So these girls get pretty desperate out here. Gross spots an argument. Okay, man, I'm gonna go up there and uh, talk to you. Wanna back me up on this? Okay. County police, what's going on here? What are you doing? In the six years they've been on the strip, the cops have checked out over 2,000 Johns, the girls' customers. John Smith. That's a good name, John Smith. You still understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. We already know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. that, that's a given. But don't be playing around out here, because there's a guy out here who doesn't, he ain't playing. Okay. okay he's, he's out to hurt you. Okay? Please be careful out here. Now here's a card. I want to give you a card. If you get something, why don't you give me a card? Just consider giving me a card. Okay? For all the sleepless nights, the watching, the waiting, and the tracing thousands of license plates through the computer, so far not one solid lead. With us now, detectives Larry Gross and Matt Haney. Matt, after all we've seen, has this effort been paying off? We don't know if we ever contacted the Green River Killer when we were contacting the girls and Johns on the street. But shortly after the Green River Task Force was formed, uh, the killings seemed to have stopped. I see. So Larry, I noticed in the tape that you always warn the girls as best you can. Do they heed these warnings? Do they pay attention? Not always, and, th and that's kind of sad, because we just try to tell them it is not safe there. And I recall an incident where a girl, I talked to her, she got arrested for her ONA and or prostitution. And she told me, I'm going to get out and I'm going to find this guy because he killed my girlfriend. And the last we saw or heard of her, uh, she was missing in 83, and we discovered her bones in 1986, uh, in June or, or so. So she found him, but, you know, it's, it's just too bad because she wasn't prepared like a lot of these girls were. We just told them, you know, stay away, stay off the street. Yeah. So the work goes on. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Okay, we have received over 2,500 calls right now. Our phone lines are a little bit backed up. Don't be discouraged, okay? Please keep calling. There's a street very much like the SeaTac Strip in San Diego. It's called El Cajon Boulevard, and in the past two years alone, 38 prostitutes and street people have been abducted from it and murdered. In fact, just last week, the latest murder occurred. Many think the killings resemble the Green River murders. Same type of victim, same M.O. When we return, we'll travel to San Diego for another piece of the puzzle, live on Manhunt. People like to write stories. She was a real uh, happy person. And let it show, because if Opal was for you, you really had a friend. Well, I've kept Opal's room pretty much like she did. Her dolls are still on her bed just like she kept them. You have to go down and you have to identify your child. And she's there with us, a big silent scream on her face. And you try to understand why anybody could do something like that. You know what Billy Ray does for a living? Since 1985, 38 women have been murdered in San Diego. Many were prostitutes. All the ones they've identified were taken from the El Cajon Boulevard area. Joining us live from San Diego is Sergeant Chuck Curtis, supervisor of San Diego's Special Homicide Task Force. Sergeant, do you have any idea who's committing all these murders? No, unfortunately, I have no idea. Well, I understand that unlike Seattle, you have two victims that were discovered very soon after they were killed. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, in late October, we had one victim uh, found in the city of San Diego within only hours after she was uh, killed. Last week, we found one in northern San Diego County uh, within less than a day. So I know you have been, but would you explain how you've been working with the Green River Task Force up here in Seattle in these cases? Yes, we visited Green River, visited the task force members, 
saw uh, the crime scenes and Green River has, has come here and done the same. Uh, we've reviewed the reports and exchanged basically uh, all the information we have on each case. All right, thank you, Detective. Now a San Diego prostitute. She's appearing under a pseudonym. She's been on the El Cajon Boulevard all during the time of the murders. Now, are other people on the street scared? Are they yes. all frightened? Very scared. Were you aware, were you closely identified with, or did you even know any of the victims? And I knew a couple of them. I see. So, what precautions are being taken? How are the girls in the street trying to take care of themselves? Now we're basically watching out for each other more than we used to. I see. So do you see anything? Are there any leads or tips? Uh, anyone or anything suspicious? Um, now everybody seems suspicious to us. Well, be very careful. Detective Tom Street. Tom is one of the members of your own task force. One of your members is here tonight collecting tips from the public. What can the viewers from San Diego do when they call in that'll help you? Well, it's uh, very important for anyone that has any information about any of the murders that have occurred here in San Diego to telephone us. Uh, by the same token, we would like to hear from anyone that knows anyone that may have lived in the Seattle area between 1982 and 1984 to telephone us, and particularly if that individual has uh, any violent propensities. All right. Well, Tom, some officials here have described your cases as being very similar to Seattle's. I have to put it to you bluntly, do you think the Green River Killer is now in San Diego? Well, uh, there are so many similarities between the cases there and the cases here that we cannot ignore that as a possibility. And as a consequence, our investigation has been oriented towards uh, maintaining a very strong relationship with the Green River Task Force. So if that indeed is a fact, and the Seattle and San Diego killers are the same man, what's the total number of victims now? Thank you. Well, if you consider the number of cases that have occurred in the uh, Northwest and here in San Diego County, uh, we are approaching 100 victims. Uh, if you consider all of the cases that have occurred on the uh, West Coast, the number may go as high as 200. Well, that's why we need people to call in. Thank you very much, Detective. Adrian? Okay, earlier in the program, Dr. Ray and Betty Pat Gatliff began work on the facial reconstruction of one of the victims. They're using the actual skull found in the dump site and classified as one of the Green River unidentified. Okay, Betty, you're just about finished. What are you working on right now? Just putting a few of the finishing touches in to make her look a little more lifelike. She certainly looks, her teeth look so real. These are her teeth. The teeth stay in the skull, so these are her teeth. We know how her teeth look. And we have a pretty good estimate, I think, of how the rest of her face went together. Okay. And Dr. Ray, what are you working on right now? Well, right now, we're just uh, putting the finishing touches. We don't know the uh, nature of the hair. There was no hair found with the remains. So as a consequence, we are faced with some artistic interpretation. We've uh, tried this uh, in times past, and there's always that artistic element which is built in the reconstruction. I see. Can we turn that to the camera so that we can get a look at how? Okay. The remains of this girl were discovered near the SeaTac Strip. She was found in 1984, but was probably murdered in 1982 or 1983. If you are missing a friend, a sister, a daughter who looked like this girl, please call us now. Not only to relieve the suffering of another family, but maybe bring us a step closer to the killer. Her name could lead us to his, the final piece in the puzzle. Here are some photos of other reconstructions done on other victims. If you recognize them, please call us now. There is another girl. We call her Christina to protect her identity. She may be the only living survivor of the Green River Killer. We asked Christina how a 15-year-old could have outwitted a man who thinks he's committed the perfect crime. I acted like I was really dead. I didn't even stop my breathing. More about what he did and what she did later in the program. By the way, we said Christina was the only known survivor. There may be others out there, others who are watching this program tonight who are too afraid to come forward up until this point. So we ask you, please call us. You could help Christina. Thank you. Once we catch and convict the killer, and we will, what should be done with him? Should he be executed for his crimes or receive life in prison? We're going to take a telephone call. If you believe that he deserves capital punishment, call 1-900-400-6381. If you believe the convicted criminal should not be killed by the state, phone 
6368, excuse me, 6382. Your call will cost a dollar. Some of the proceeds will be donated to the reward fund, and if not, used for the victims' families. I grew up on pictures, violent pictures and books and magazines. Uh, genuine severed heads, genuine stabbed dead people. Terry was a lovable person. She was involved in choir, singing, church, and she was a very bright, intelligent person. She always felt that she could handle everything. I have a dream that she's going to come back, that the person we buried was not her. As we've mentioned, we don't have a picture of what the Green River Killer looks like. That's the way it is in most serial killer cases. And that's why science has recently developed another profiling technique, psychology. What is the composite of the killer's mind? We're going to delve into the criminal mind. These computerized images probe through the skull to the emotional control center of the brain a nerve circuit called the limbic ring. Here, neural wiring for passion and affection. Here, for rage and violence. Only a hair's breadth separates love from hate. But injury, like child abuse, can cause short-circuiting, confusion. In this computer map of brain activity, the red colors show feelings, the blue, an emotional void. In the criminal mind, the switches for tenderness are cold, but the triggers for violence, hot. What should be normal passion is distorted, deranged, deadly. With me from the FBI is Special Agent John Douglas, one of the fathers of the science of profiling. John, what, what's the mindset of a serial killer? Patrick, he's a, a very sane, very, very intelligent uh, individual who definitely knows uh, right from wrong, who seeks uh, victims to uh, fulfill a compulsion where he can manipulate, dominate, uh, humiliate, and control his victims both physically as well as mentally. So consequently, he se seeks out the very, very weak and passive type of uh, victim who he can, can control. So what is the definition, or maybe you can tell us a little more about what pre-offensive and post-offensive behavior is? Pre-offense behavior is the, the behavior leading up to the crime. We have a, an offender, these, these types of offenders who have been abused, neglected a, as a child. They have an extreme amount of anger, frustration, coupled with the, uh, the need for sadomasochistic types of uh, pornography, coupled with uh, failings in life, uh, financial problems, personal problems, they now begin to surface at the age of 25 to 28 years of age and now go on the hunt looking for their first kill. See, and post-offensive? Post-offense behavior is, is the behavior immediately following the crime, which is very, very interesting and viewers should recognize, is that the subject becomes uh, just obsessed with the investigation. He generally may maintain a diary, a scrapbook of newspaper clippings. He'll take a, uh, an artifact belonging to uh, a victim and then give, uh, give that artifact to a significant woman in his life who he wants to wear a piece, piece of clothing, a piece of jewelry. He may even take uh, this significant woman in his life to a crime scene and have sex with her or to uh, one of the disposal sites and, and get, out, get out of the vehicle and just act very, very strange and odd. I see, I've, I've heard a couple of statements and you can clear this up. Does, does the violent act replace sex for these individuals? Yes, it does. The, uh, the, the violent act uh, is, is everything. Sex is secondary. The, it's the aphrodisiac is the hunt and the kill. I see. And what about the ritual? We often hear about that. Well, the ritual, we have a modus operandi. In law enforcement, we should recognize that modus operandi changes with experience. But the ritual, what he says to the victim, how he taunts the victim, manipulates her, and, uh, and controls that victim, that is the ritual which is a constant. I see. 
Dave, I know that you have something that if this Green River killer is watching, you'd like to say to him, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, I've worked this case uh, for over six years now, and I feel very confident that someone will soon be leading us to you. When we get this information, no one will care anything about you or your problems. All everyone will want is for you to be punished. Many investigators believe that you enjoy the killings. Several of us believe that you are haunted by them, that you want your own nightmare to stop, that this experience for you has been, been a nightmare. However, this nightmare will not end. It still haunts you during every waking hour. You must contact me soon before someone calls and leads us to you. If we identify you first, no one will care what you think or feel. It will be too late. Please call me. It's time for us to talk. I grew up on pictures, violent pictures and books and magazines. Uh, genuine severed heads, genuine stabbed dead people, uh, real murder scenes, um, and this titillated all of the audience. But it fed a certain small percentage of that audience that might later get into sacrificial murder, might get into some kinds of uh, other worship that uh, may be their own end. You never hear from them again, so there's no resolution to the formula. In my case, it got to where it was like a dope fiend running from corner to corner looking for a better high. Going from theater to theater looking for sleazier, bloodier movies. And looking around furtively at other people going in and every now and then one of them looking furtively back at me and I'm saying, there's a brother, there's a sister. Next, we will share the unforgettable true story of the young 15-year-old girl who was strangled and stabbed by a man many believe to be the Green River Killer. He thinks he left her for dead, but he's wrong. What's your name? Man had lied. Like, when he strangled me, he checked my pulse. Or when he stabbed me once, he checked my pulse. When he stabbed me again, checked my pulse. Call it a miracle that she's still alive, or maybe just call her a survivor, possessed of an indomitable human will to live. Or perhaps just call her lucky. She should have died in a remote ravine in Oregon three years ago, in September 1985. She was brutalized by a man who might have been the Green River Killer. The incident happened during the time he was thought to have remained in the highways of Oregon. We call her Christina to protect her identity. She wears a bit of disguise, and our picture is distorted to ensure her safety. It's at the risk of that safety and her emotional well-being that Christina courageously agreed to appear on the program with us now and to relive that night, a woman's worst nightmare come true. Christina's hope is that her appearance and the information she provides may inspire someone to phone in a lead that could result in the apprehension of her assailant or other sexual killers. The interview was conducted by psychiatrist Dr. John Berberich, who works with the Seattle and King County authorities. This is Christina's story quite a story to tell. We've talked before. Um, you certainly don't have to relive this entire set of events. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that will perhaps help in catching this, this person. How long ago was it that, that, uh, that this happened to you? Three years. About three years ago. Uh -huh. Yeah. And a lot of things have happened in your life since then. Yeah. Yeah. Many, many. How would you feel just talking a little bit about what happened, what you experienced? I guess I'm scared. You're scared, of course you are. Look cameras. Yeah, there's the cameras and... <laughs> a bunch of people that I don't even know. Yeah, right. And it's natural for you to be scared. Mm -hmm. I'm a little nervous myself. If you look at me, I think that'll just go away, and, uh, and we can talk. 
It was three years ago. Um, what month was it? September. In September, so a little bit less. Huh? And you had been traveling up and down the coast. On uh, September 5th, 1985, uh, Christina was standing on a street corner. Um, she was looking for a ride, and a gentleman in a blue taxi stopped and picked her up. Uh, she described him as a white male, uh, late 20s, maybe early 30s, having uh, collar-length blonde hair, uh, piercing blue eyes, as she described them, just average build. Um, he seemed normal. He grabbed me and put a knife to my throat. He said, don't move or don't try anything or I'm going to kill you. Um, at this point, she, being fairly smart, feared for her life and did basically what he told her to do, um, which was to turn around and face over the back, face to the back of the car, so that he then bound her hands and her elbows together with tape. He made me go on the floor and he stuck a knife in my back and he started driving. They drove out of town, and at the time, she was not sure where they went. I was scared. I tried to get out of the car, too. I tried to open the door and fall out, but I couldn't. Then he got out and, and put on some kind of ski outfit thing because it was really, really cold. It was raining and stuff. She is pulled from the car, the passenger side, where she is then punched in the face twice and thrown on the hood of the car. Um, he tears the uh, tape off of her hands and her elbows, tears her dress off of her, actually it was a sweater type dress that she was wearing, and he rapes her on the hood of the car twice. Well, I already knew he was going to kill me, so I was just trying to figure out how I was going to live. That's all. I just tried to think of what he was going to do next. He then pulls her off the hood of the car, punches her again, uh, swears, mutters something, walks over to the car, and she sees him wiping his hand with a rag uh, that he's removed from the car. Evidently, he must have cut a knuckle or something. He then comes back and takes her pantyhose, rolls her over on her stomach so that his, her back is to him, and uses her pantyhose as a ligature and proceeds to strangle her. Um, the pantyhose break. He then produces a bandana which he'd supplied himself evidently and strangles her again. They broke, both of them broke, and so he quit doing it. And then he went to get the knife and he started stabbing me. You can't really feel it. You could hear it though. Because it happened so fast and the knife's sharp that you can't really feel it pierce. He then drug her to an embankment and twisted her legs so she rolled down the hill. He then followed her down the hill, stabbed her again, checked her pulse on her wrist and both on her neck. Like when he strangled me, he checked my pulse. Or when he stabbed me once, he checked my pulse. When he stabbed me again, he checked my pulse. And he buried me with grass. He then walked back up to the top of the hill and she was laying in such a manner that she could see him again, smoking a cigarette. Um, the whole time this was happening, it was raining. Um, very wet, very cold, very miserable. Um, she blacks out. Uh, when she comes to, he's no longer there. She realizes that if she doesn't get up the bank and get help, that she's going to die there. I climbed up the hill. And then I started trying to walk out to the, um, the street. Fortunately for her, there was some people on vacation who drove by in a camper and they picked her up and transported her where she could get some medical help. I decided I wasn't gonna die. I just wanted to go home. Christina is now 18, a lovely young woman in the very prime of her youth. But there are days when she still suffers waking nightmares. There are nights that she can't sleep at all. She's under continual psychological therapy. Until tonight, she has been in hiding. Her appearance may very well signal a milestone in her understanding of that night three years ago and her future life. Christina is proof, living proof, that her killer did not commit the perfect crime, but was outsmarted by a teenager. 
There are 48 other young women of the Pacific Northwest and thousands of other victims of serial killers across the country who did not survive. And Christina dedicates her appearance to their memory and their untold stories. Kimmy, oh, she was so cute. She didn't walk, she danced. She was a little girl next door. She was everybody's sweetheart. When things get out of hand and I can't handle it, that's the way I think of her. I would like to have met the woman she would have been. She would have been somebody. Welcome back to the last chapter of Manhunt. During the past two hours, we've conducted the largest televised criminal investigation in history, and you've all been a part of it. For our 900 number, over 25,000 people called in so far, and over 90% of you were for capital punishment. And as far as our 800 lines, thousands of calls have been coming in from all across the country. There is a one hour backup, however, but I don't want to discourage you because detectives will be here tonight and for the next two weeks, so please keep your calls going. Now, we've had a sighting on Richard Caputo, the serial killer from New York. We told you about him at the beginning of the program, and the call came from Sarasota, Florida. California, the name of a man caller claims is killed and buried his children, five of them. We've got the location and are getting in touch with the local police. Two calls from New York for Lieutenant Tim Burns. They located a murder suspect in New York. Also, regarding the Green River Killer, a New York call, a girl called and reported she was sexually assaulted in Washington a few years ago, gave us the name of a suspect. Incredible. These calls keep coming in. Remember, the number is 1-800. 722-5555. Your tips will be given anonymously. The person on the other end of the phone will assign you a code. They will explain how the code system works. Okay. How are we doing over here, guys? More calls coming in. All right. If you were to walk inside the sanctuary of the Green River Task Force, your eyes would be drawn to the very heart of the investigation, the photos of 48 young women the victims. Our program is also dedicated to their memory, and that's why tonight's last words will be to the Green River Killer himself. Whoever you are, wherever you are, there's no more hiding. The largest police force in the entire world is after you, the American public. They'll catch you, and they'll convict you, and we have a lot of reasons why. These are your reasons.
travel arrangements for Crime Stoppers provided by American Airlines. Fly American Airlines with convenient flights to over 225 destinations worldwide. American Airlines, something special in the air. This is a Q13 Manhunt Update. I'm Catherine Carboni, reporting live from the Manhunt Phone Center, and with me tonight is Lieutenant Dan Nolan of the Green River Task Force. Lieutenant Nolan, everyone keeps talking about that one tip that's going to break this case. Has, the, has that one tip come in tonight? It's very difficult to assess a tip as it comes in. Uh, we can't say at this point that we've got the one most important tip in the investigation at this point because we have to analyze the information that we're dealing with. And we won't know if we have a very, very good tip probably for a couple of days. Certainly a lot of the information that we've received tonight is going to be very valuable and very important and we'll check it out over the next few days. Taken together, a lot of little tips can add up to one big breakthrough though, correct? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, that's just the way these things work. You get little bits of information, another little piece of the puzzle, and ultimately we put it together, it falls together, then we've got our good suspects. So something that might not seem significant to the one person calling in could really be significant. I think that's the key, really, is to understand that uh, the significance of all the bits of information together become the big significant thing. And until we have an opportunity to tie all those seemingly insignificant things together, uh, we won't really know, but all the information we get, all the calls that are coming in uh, are really important. We want to urge people to continue to call in. It's only through their efforts and our ability to then to correlate that information will we ultimately come up with the tip we're looking for. How can people continue to help after this program is over? Can they continue to keep on their minds the fact that serial crime is not just a police problem. It takes all of us in the community to solve it. And if they have any suspicion about any kind of activity that might go towards some of the things they've learned tonight on the program, they should continue to report to us. And these phone banks will be open for two or three weeks yet to take those calls. Yeah, the phone banks in this room will be open for another uh, two or three hours tonight. And they'll be manned again tomorrow and in this building for the next week and a half. And then they'll be transferred to the Crime Stoppers number in downtown Seattle. So don't stop calling. We urge them to continue to call because somebody ultimately will answer their call. All right. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Dan Nolan of the Green River Task Force. Well, this broadcast is over, but this investigation is not, and it won't be until every phone is, has stopped ringing and every tip has been followed up. Thank you for watching the Manhunt Live broadcast tonight, and thank you for your help in capturing the Green River Killer. I'm Catherine Carboni. Good night. Fox Television for the Northwest. This is Q13 KCPQ.